Hey everybody, welcome to The Damage Report. We're here to close out the week on this Friday with a gigantic show. Uh, during the show, we're gonna be talking about the uh, Coast Guard domestic terrorist and some of the media narratives around why exactly he was going to do what he was going to do, and the people who were curiously silent about this particular incident. Uh, we're also gonna talk about uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez fighting dark money advertising inside of New York City. Uh, we're gonna talk with uh, an awesome guest, one of, uh, one of what I think should be one of the most influential uh, psychologists uh, in media today. That is uh, David Dunning, creator of the Dunning-Kruger effect, which has gotten a lot of talk in the age of Donald Trump. We're gonna talk about how appropriate that actually is, what it really means, and how we can work to get past some of our ignorance about our own ignorance in politics, which I think is needed more than ever before. Sort of related to that, I recently started the Say Something Nice Challenge in politics on Twitter. We got thousands of responses, the idea being, just say something nice about a politician that you have no intention of actually supporting. To keep people a little bit level-headed, a little bit rational, you guys sent in so many, and we're gonna be closing out the show and the week with a little bit of that. But first, serious matters. Many people across the country were shocked to find out that a Coast Guard lieutenant apparently planned to assassinate politicians and members of the media before going on to kill literally as many people as he possibly could, up to and including every person on the planet. And because that's so shocking, lots of people were talking about it. But not everyone was talking about it. Some corners were curiously silent. And uh, the White House, not really interested in talking about this, despite the fact that under their watch, they stopped a potential terror attack. So why so silent? Well, asked for comment on this because she had to be asked since they were not forthcoming. White House spokeswoman Sarah Huckabee Sanders said, the president and the entire administration have condemned violence in all forms, as we've stated many times. Sanders did not respond to questions about whether Trump planned to tone down his rhetoric. And we'll return to the president's rhetoric uh, shortly. But let's talk about the rest of government because uh, White House doesn't really wanna talk about it. In fact, the DOJ, the ones who stopped it, they don't really wanna talk about it, which is weird in terms of recent history. So outside of the court filings that reporters found, the DOJ isn't saying anything. And sort of related to that, a study published last year by the Washington-based Institute for Social Policy and Understanding showed that the Justice Department was six times more likely to issue press releases in alleged plots that involved Muslims than non-Muslims. Something that is both simultaneously obviously the case and thankfully we actually have the numbers on it. So here you have a white guy who wanted to start a race war, who wanted to gun down Democratic politicians and liberal media figures. They stopped him before he could do it, before he could kill someone, before he could kill lots of people. And they don't really care to talk about it. Weird, huh? Now, uh, Donald Trump, a guy who was involved early on on pushing some of the narratives that this guy apparently believed about politicians, about the media, about particular politicians and members of the media. Uh, he's silent, which is weird because he's not generally a silent sort of guy. Like, let's talk one particular topic, criticism of the media. He criticizes the media. This guy wanted to gun down people in the media. Apparently, since he became a presidential candidate, Trump has sent more than 1,300 tweets critical of the media. That is a huge number. That is more than anyone should ever tweet about anything. He tweets about that just in terms of attacking the media. Now, to be fair, is it fair? that I am comparing his rhetoric against the media and right-wing extremists who want to assassinate members of the media. Well, look, he's tweeted 1,300 times, but maybe it's really nuanced, okay? Well, let's take a look at a few. So we have nuanced critique like, fake news is truly the enemy of the people. And uh, the fake news media, failing New York Times, NBC News, ABC, CBS, CNN, is not my enemy, it is the enemy of the American people. So just to be really clear, we know that objectively the reason he demonizes the media and particular people in the media is because they threaten his power and influence. So he understands that, thus the projection. They're not my enemy when that is at best all that they are from his point of view, their enemy. They're the enemy of the American people. And as we say many times, if someone is your enemy, what do you do? If you have been trained, if your career for multiple decades has been in the armed forces, what do you do to the enemy of America and its people? Some people will take that to be a metaphor, thankfully. Maybe Trump means it to be a metaphor, but not everybody will take it that way. And some people have both the resources in terms of weapons and ammunition and the motivation and the skills to actually do something about it. 
You also have this, the New York Times reporting is false, they are true, enemy of the people. We bring that one up because that was just a couple of days ago. So the weird thing is, Donald Trump hasn't said anything about this. Isn't that weird? He found time to say something about Jesse Smollett, um, calling it uh, racism because he attacked uh, MAGA people. Weird that he thinks that criticizing MAGA is a racial attack. I thought all sorts of people believed in making America great again. Apparently Trump doesn't think so. He thinks it's one race, I don't know which one. Maybe it's Indian Americans, I don't know. Um, he didn't make time uh, to talk about this, but he did talk about Jesse Smollett. He talked about the, the Covington High School kids a bunch of times. He, he found time to do that. Um, weird, he, he talks about SNL when they criticize him. But his administration successfully stopping a domestic terrorist, he doesn't find time for. And is it because he's just not interested or he doesn't know about it? Or is it because he acknowledges that this guy, for better or worse, let's say best case scenario, Donald Trump has no interest in any act of violence against any of his enemies, political or otherwise. And this guy just took things exactly the wrong way. Donald Trump, even in that best case scenario, understands that this guy was going after his list of political enemies on the politics side and on the media side. He was targeting Senator Blumenthal, a guy who no one in the country has him as one of their top enemies other than Donald Trump. Nancy Pelosi, who of course he continually attacks, Maxine Waters, who he has literally threatened on social media before, and members of the media, in particular members of the media, he, this uh, terrorist was searching for them immediately after Donald Trump criticized them. So he knows that that looks absolutely horrendous. We know the implications of that, but Donald Trump, of course, does not want to own up to why his rhetoric could be contributing to acts of violence in the past and in the future. So I ask you, how many of these do we need before it's fair for us to have a national conversation about the threat that Donald Trump and his social media activity pose? Cesar Sayoc sent literally over a dozen pipe bombs to people on Donald Trump's enemy list. This guy wanted to gun them down to assassinate them. He wanted to kill members of the Supreme Court to open up seats for Donald Trump. He wanted to clear out all the main media critics of Donald Trump. So we have Cesar Sayoc, who thankfully failed in his acts of domestic terror. You have this guy that thankfully was tracked down and stopped before his acts of political and racial terror. How many people do we need in this list? Is there anyone? in Barack Obama's two terms, not two years, two terms in, presidents, in, in the presidency. Is there anyone like this that pops up that can be credibly said to have been directly inspired by the president's rhetoric? You know that that's not true. You know that that doesn't exist, but we're living in that. And we're just two years into what could be eight plus years of Donald Trump as president. Maybe that doesn't scare you at this point, it certainly scares me. And so now I wanna to turn to another aspect of this. Fox News has mentioned, the Coast Guard terrorist, it has come up. Has it come up to the extent that it would in terms of minutes spent on it, segments spent on it, shows spent on it, if this guy was black, if he was Muslim? You know the answer to that, of course not. It has been mentioned briefly at best. And to the extent that they have talked about it, they have talked about it in terms of trying to shift the narrative away from Donald Trump having any culpability on this topic. But we've talked about Donald Trump, let's talk about Fox News. Let's talk about what the Coast Guard terrorist believed was going on in this country and where he might have gotten these crazy ideas. Because you've probably seen some of his writings. He believed that the president was uh, the target of an illegitimate coup, that the deep state and all of those, they were working to undermine and remove the president. That there was a civil war that was already happening and thus it was time to start a literal civil war. Okay, so that happened earlier this week. Let's see how Fox News addressed this topic. Within just like 24 to 36 hours of this news breaking, Laura Ingram had a guy on her show, Joe DiGenova. And let's see how he talked about what was going on politically in our country. We are in a civil war in this country. There's two standards of justice, one for Democrats, one for Republicans. The press is all Democrat, all liberal, all progressive, all left. They hate Republicans, they hate Trump. So the suggestion that there's ever going to be civil discourse in this country for the foreseeable future is over. It's not going to be, it's going to be total war. And as I say to my friends, I do two things, I vote and I buy guns. Okay, so you heard it there. There is a civil war going on now. So loyal conservatives watching Fox News, the message from that guest is go buy guns. Vote too, that's fine, but definitely buy guns because there is no civil discourse anymore. There is a civil war, not in the future, right now. 
So look, the general, the obvious thing that you do when a guy like the Coast Guard terrorist pops up is you look at his writing and you think, oh my God, was that sort of messaging, the things that he believed, the deranged thoughts that he had, and Laura Ingram calls them deranged, where would he have gotten that sort of messaging? And you can look back and say, well, Fox News talks about that way quite a bit, and we'll return to that. But Laura Ingram decides to go a step beyond that. She's not just content to have stoked those feelings and those fears and those thoughts in the past. She brings on a guy after that happens to double down on it. To say, if any of you out there, if you're in the Coast Guard or somewhere else in the military, or maybe not in the military at all, if you agree with the Coast Guard terrorist, if you think that there is a civil war, that there's an illegitimate plot to remove the president, and this guy was stopped, if you think that that was a bad thing, if you think he was really on to something, I've got your back. And I am gonna flood the airwaves with people who are gonna stoke more fear, more anger, more rage against what's going on in this country, using the exact same language that the Coast Guard domestic terrorist was using in his writings. Laura Ingram, she knows who this guy is. Did she denounce him immediately after he said that? No, of course not. She agrees with him. She thinks the Coast Guard terrorist has absolutely nothing to do with Donald Trump. She said that he's just a deranged freak. And of course he is. Have you seen his skin? Of course he's a lone wolf. He's just a guy with mental health problems. He's not, he's not following on from a particular strain of divisive, violent political rhetoric, a political ideology being continually pushed on Fox News night after night. He's just a weirdo, don't pay him any attention. And us leftists in the media, we're trying to tie it to Trump. You're tying it to Trump and Donald Trump and Fox News in who you're bringing on literally after we find out about the, the guy. Now look, that's one time, you might say I'm focusing too much on a particular guest. It wasn't even Laura Ingram after all, it was just a guest. Well, Media Matters done a great job of looking back on the, the terminology that Fox News has used recently involving a coup and an illegitimate attempt to get rid of the president. Here's some of that mashup. Now witnessing a deep state coup. I'll explain in detail, there's no doubt any longer. We were mocked, Laura, for That's saying true. this for all this time, that there is this soft coup against Donald Trump. They're plotting basically what amounts to a political coup. You heard it right. They're trying to undermine our democracy and create a constitutional crisis. This is about a full on assault by the left, the Democratic Party, to absolutely carry out a coup d'etat. And this doesn't appear to be a witch hunt. It appears to be a silent coup. They so hate this president and the American people. They, the, the FBI agents that tried to undermine Trump in this soft coup. What is happening here is a coup d'etat, what I call a soft coup. A silent coup to get him out of office. By the way, if it were happening in a less developed country, we'd know exactly what to call it. It's an attempted coup. If that's true, we have a coup on our hands. This is an attempted coup d'etat to get rid of the duly elected president of the United States. We're gonna lose the country. They want to subvert his administration. They would love to carry out an actual coup d'etat. Okay, so by the way, that's not the entire video. We just don't play multi-minute videos on this show, but go to Media Matters and you'll see it. It's on their front page right now. So you saw it there, you heard it right in Sean Hannity's words. They continually tell their viewers there is a coup going on. Okay, so what is actually going on? Just briefly, Robert Mueller is investigating whether Donald Trump and his campaign broke the law. Uh, that is not only obviously necessary, but it is 100% legal. There have been any number of different special counsels and special investigators uh, that Fox News has championed in past years. Uh, nothing illegitimate, nothing illegal, nothing subversive, nothing deep state about that. Uh, they also tried to say that what, um, what McCabe was talking about, about uh, the conversation that he apparently had at one point about the use of the 25th Amendment, that that's a coup. First of all, it's not a coup, it's literally in the Constitution. It's an amendment to the Constitution, making it not only legal, but by its very nature, constitutional. So, and by the way, he had a conversation. McCabe, if it came to using the 25th Amendment, McCabe would have no part in that. That is for the vice president and the cabinet of the presidency to do. So if it were to go through, if you were to have an invoking of the 25th Amendment that was successful, which we've literally never had in our country's history, by its very nature, that would be a 100% Republican effort that was going on. A Republican effort that were it to happen, you might not like, you might think it's a bad idea, but it would not be illegal, it would not be unconstitutional. So let's return to Fox News. There are people out there like the Coast Guard terrorist that think thanks to this message 
that what is going on is inherently unconstitutional and illegitimate. And if you have the power to do something about it, it is thus contingent on you to do something about that. Now, for most people, you don't have any weapons, you don't have any military training, you would go out there, you might protest, you might do calls, you might vote in a particular way. The vast majority of Republicans and conservatives would never do anything violent, even after listening to that deranged onslaught of coups and coup d'etats and coup d'etats. They disagree about how it's supposed to be pronounced on Fox News. But some people do have guns. Some people have been trained for decades that you kill your enemies. Some people will take it seriously. They have been taught that you defend the Constitution, that you defend the country, you defend the presidency, all of that. They don't necessarily know what order you're supposed to do that in, but they know that they have a duty. And if their duty involves the use of force, they will do that. Now, this guy, the Coast Guard guy, he was stopped. But will the next guy get stopped? Will the next deranged lunatic in the Coast Guard or the Army or the Air Force or the Space Force or the Marines, will they take it as seriously as this guy did? Will they think it's their job to open up a spot on the Supreme Court for Donald Trump? Will they think it's their job to take out critics like Adam Schiff and Senator Blumenthal and AOC and Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer? Will they think it's their job to stop the illegitimate fake news assault against the president and clear out the newsroom of MSNBC and CNN and take out those bastards at the Washington Post and New York Times? They are fed a healthy diet every day of violence and hatred and fear and suspicion. At some point, someone will act. At various points, people have already acted. We've already had attempted acts of assassination and terror. And now, just this week, we find out we have more. Will Fox News change their rhetoric? We know that the president isn't going to. We've given up on that. We have a dictator in office. He's never going to stop trying to get people killed in the media. Will Fox News stop using this terminology of a coup? We'll find out. We'll be watching them. We'll see. Media Matters. They'll be watching. Will they moderate based on what obvious impact their words have had? We will find out in the near future. My hopes are not high. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, let's talk about another consequence of the hatred and fear that the right wing has been spreading when it comes to hate groups blossoming all over the country after this. We need to talk about a relatively new show called Un the Republic or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media, and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies, debunking the conventional wisdom. In each episode of Un the Republic, or UNFTR, the host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated by the so-called powers that be, featuring in-depth research, razor-sharp commentary, and just the right amount of vulgarity, the UNFTR podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows. But don't just take my word for it. The New York Times described UNFTR as consistently compelling and educational, aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school. For as the great philosopher Yoda once put it, you must unlearn what you have learned. And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today and get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time. Here's some scary news for you. Apparently, the number of hate groups operating inside of the US last year rose to an all time high. It rose 7% in 2018. The SPLC, which has tracked hate groups for about 50 plus years at this point, found that there were 1,020 operating in the US last year, breaking the record of 1,018 set back in 2011. So it looks like there have been a little bit of progress in the intervening years. It's four consecutive years of growth of a variety of different hate groups. Now, they espouse a, you know, a wide range of different ideologies. They come from different parts of the political spectrum, but do not believe for one second that they are distributed evenly across either of those things. There are definitely hot spots. And the Southern Poverty Law Center, in their uh, intelligence project reporting on this, they believe that there is one reason that we reached a record last year. Uh, Heidi Birick says the numbers tell a striking story that this 
president is not simply a polarizing figure, but a radicalizing one. Rather than trying to tamp down hate, as presidents of both parties have done, President Trump elevates it with both his rhetoric and his policies. And so, uh, how is that the case, rhetoric and policies? Well, we know in terms of rhetoric, like, he defends white supremacists and neo Nazis, calling them, you know, very fine people and all of that. Uh, he espouses the most Islamophobic approach to world politics in terms of bans on travel and stuff like that that I've seen in my lifetime. Um, anyone south of the southern border is automatically assumed to be some sort of criminal who is doing whatever they can to get into our country and ruin it, that thus creating more racism of that particular variety. Uh, the way that he has pro- approached groups like BLM and all of that. Super aggressive and violent and, and radical. Um, basically, regardless of what form of hate that you uh, are a fan of in this country, you have found a champion in Donald Trump, and perhaps even more importantly, the variety of politicians that have been inspired by him. People like Steve King, who are being more open in their racism and white supremacy than ever before. You had multiple literal Nazis running in Republican primaries last year, feeling emboldened, thinking, you know what? I look out there in America and I feel more free to think and to say and to act on these beliefs than we ever have in our lifetime. And you've seen that all over. And these groups, you know, thankfully you see also some uh, some uh, protest groups. So bear in mind, not everyone you saw in those pictures is a white supremacist. Some of them are working against it. So that is uh, definitely a good thing. And what's amazing is I wanna, I wanna mention something that, a point that Brooke had made on Monday when we were talking about a similar topic. It's that this explosion of hate groups has happened while Donald Trump has been president, a powerful president because he has been not shy at all about using things like executive powers and national emergency declarations. So they have the presidency, they've gotten two Supreme Court justices, they control the Supreme Court, they control the Senate up until very recently and you know the entirety of the time in this study, they controlled the Congress as well. And even though they control the governorships and state legislatures and all of the federal government, they still feel like, no, it's all these groups. They control the power, they have the power behind the scenes. This whole myth of the deep state was designed to allow you to be anti-government while controlling all of the government. And so under Barack Obama, when it looked like libs were taken over, you had an explosion of hate groups. Under Donald Trump, when the conservatives literally control virtually everything, you have an explosion of hate groups. They have figured out a way to have their hate and eat it too. And so at this point, I don't know what the solution is. If we get a great progressive, will that not just cause more white supremacy and more like, oh God, they're coming in and they're taking everything? If they get Don Jr. next time, is he gonna play on these things? Is there any solution? I think that there are solutions, but not while Donald Trump is president, because the other side of it, not just the rhetoric, but the policies, not only things like the Muslim ban, the building of the wall and everything, but remember that he has specifically defunded and destroyed organizations inside of the FBI and other groups that are designed to look into these sorts of extremist groups, to try to stop them from organizing and radicalizing more and more people. He has tried to set the stage for exactly this explosion of hate groups that you're seeing in that report. And now the question is, what will come from all those groups? When you have more than a thousand of these groups operating throughout the US, how much faith do you have that they will not be successful in their goals, whether political or violent? We're gonna take a short break, we come back, we're gonna turn uh, We're gonna turn to a slightly different topic. So new representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is shedding more light on the uh, corrosive influence of dark money in politics. We'll break that down after this. If you're still questioning how influential new representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in, is in the Democratic Party right now, just take a look at what she's getting credit for. Obviously, she's getting credit for things that she's pushing for, you know, a new conversation about taxation on the wealthy, the Green New Deal, topics like this. But even things that she is saying, I didn't do, man, the right really wants to make sure that you think that she's responsible for it. So let's take a look at a billboard in Times uh, Time Square. It says, Amazon pull out, 25,000 lost New York City jobs, 4 billion lost in lost wages, 12 billion in lost economic activity for New York. Thanks for nothing, AOC. And you see at the bottom, it's the, um, that's not the Cartoon Network, that's Job Creators Network, paid for by Job Creators Network. And hashtag socialism takes, capitalism creates. Yeah, capitalism is just, it's been great for literally everybody. Um, okay, so uh, AOC, why did you do it? Why did you kill the wages and the economic activity? And all of those numbers that you saw there were extremely optimistic um, ideas of what Amazon's HQ in New York possibly might have created. And of course, doesn't acknowledge any of the negatives that people were organizing uh, against. 
And what's interesting is that she says that she doesn't deserve the credit for that, that yes, she did criticize Amazon for moving in. It wasn't even in her congressional district that they would have been moving into, but that local activists are the ones who actually deserve the credit for it. We'll return to that in just a second. But let's take a look at that. So there's um, an effort to stop this company from moving in. Uh, at the national level, there's a conversation, people criticize it and all of that. And all of a sudden, billboards start popping up. So who actually is paying for that? To what extent can we know who is paying for the billboard, what interests and lob and industries and all of that they actually represent. So people have been looking into it. Andrew Perez uh, uh, tweeted, who's behind the dark money group bashing AOC in Times Square? Notorious AstroTurf firm Berman and Com uh, Company got 2.5 million from the organization, the Job Creators Network in 2017. Uh, Cavalry LLC, founded by Mitch McConnell's former chief of staff was paid 419K. Um, so this is some initial uh, investigation around what we know about this organization and some of their uh, funders. And AOC also weighed in saying, few things effectively communicate the power we've built in fighting dark money and anti-worker policies like billionaire funded groups blowing tons of cash on whack billboards. This one is funded by the Mercers. P.S. Fact that it's in Times Square tells you this isn't for or by New Yorkers, which is certainly true. Um, then she went on to say, billionaires paying to put up anti-progressive propaganda in Times Square is like the obscenely rich version of the scene where Michael Scott points to the Bubba Gump and saying, this is it, this is the heart of civilization right here. And she then tweeted a, a clip from uh, The Office making her again uh, the best politician in the country. Um, now look, since then, she has backed off of her particular criticisms of some of the people because we honestly don't know at this point exactly if Mercer money went into it or if what Andrew Perez was saying. Do we know that the money that was you know, from Mitch McConnell and all that? And we don't know. And so she's being responsible and saying, you know what, I'm gonna wait for more information to come out. But that whole thing, that is the problem that we see here. That gigantic media bias can happen and you have no idea who actually supports it. Is it right-wing billionaires? Is it left-wing billionaires? Is it a pro-union group? Is it a, an anti-fracking group? We don't necessarily have to know because our system completely incentivizes dark money. The amount of transparency and reporting that you need to do is, uh, I would say theoretically, at least in the past couple of decades, is an all-time low. Um, efforts to push for more of that have been, uh, have been counterattacked by the Republicans nearly at every step. Simply knowing where the money is coming from is considered a step too far in our conversations about money and politics recently. And so she is attempting to make that more clear. She did it recently in C-SPAN where she was talking about all the different ways that you could fund your campaigns. If you're running for Congress or for the presidency, how much money you can get from corporations, how much you can do in office to, uh, to benefit those corporations and to benefit yourself by owning stock in corporations that you are either pushing for or pulling for regulations on. And so now she's doing it for dark money as well. And I just, I love that she's being targeted for that, that she is just a poster child, literally, in Times Square now for progressive reforms in these areas. And the reason that I bring this up is not just because the Amazon issue is really important and not just because we need to continually talk about dark money, but it's a reminder again that when people looked at the Green New Deal and said, why does this include so much? This is why. So when you look at the Green New Deal proposal and you say, why isn't it just environmental stuff? Why does it have stuff to incentivize new jobs? Why does it have components of money and politics? Why, does it, why is it interested in economic justice, environmental justice, all of these different things? Why shouldn't it just be about how we generate electricity in this country? It's because they're all tied together, okay? You need those jobs to push for the Green New Deal and make it a real thing. You need to better regulate money and politics to stop disingenuous campaigns led by the exact billionaires that are benefiting from the current system of fossil fuels and all of that, to stop them from completely uh, torpedoing any effort to get uh, a Green New Deal. So all of these things are tied together and you need a politician who is both understanding enough of the underlying foundation of all these issues, but also is effective enough of a communicator to make sure that people understand the stakes. And they need to understand that you can't just be in it for one policy or one area of politics. You have to understand the totality of it to make any headway whatsoever. In this way, she's incredibly reminiscent of Bernie Sanders. He understands that only structural reforms can make individual pieces of legislation actually possible. That so long as you have unregulated and largely unreported money in politics, you're not gonna be able to get a higher minimum wage at the national level. You're not gonna be able to get free public college at the national level. You need to do the work at the bottom to make sure that at the top on the specifics, we actually get the change that we need. 
Now, with that said, we are going to take another break. We come back. Uh, David Dunning is going to be joining us to break down the Dunning Kruger effect, its implications for politics, some misunderstandings of the concept, and how we can actually, as individuals, work to understand our own ignorance and move forward after this. Over the past few years, there's a good chance you've come across the Dunning-Kruger effect being referenced in articles and conversations on cable news. But what does it actually mean? How does it relate to politicians, and especially Donald Trump, who is often invoked in reference to? Joining us now to break down the concept is David Dunning, a social psychologist and professor of psychology at the University of Michigan. Uh, David Dunning, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you. Uh, very glad to have you here. So the Dunning-Kruger effect, it is uh, complex. People are just starting to learn about it and in some cases taking sort of the wrong idea from it in how they apply it to politics. So what does it actually mean based on your research? Well, the, uh, the Dunning-Kruger effect, if you boil it down to its most basic form, is simply the observation that uh, incompetent people or people who aren't experts um, don't know they aren't experts, or, or scratch that, they actually can't know they, they're experts, or they can't know uh, the shortcomings or the incompetencies uh, that they may uh, possess. Uh, that's what it is in its short form. Uh, the key in the way in which people tend to get it wrong is they tend to think that this is a phenomenon that basically inflicts other people and it's all about them and how they get it wrong. But actually the key thing to keep in mind is this is a phenomenon that sooner or later hits all of us. Uh, it's really about us and our own incompetencies and our own shortcomings. Exactly, yeah. yeah. I, as a person with a lot of pride in myself, would like to assume that it only happens to other people, but I do want to be more cognizant of it. And so that's why in, in a little bit we will talk about some ways to, be, to try to be aware of this and what you can do to uh, sort of circumvent it. Um, in terms of politics, though, it is most often invoked in my experience and by me uh, in reference to Donald Trump. So what is it about Donald Trump that makes it that people want to use this concept to explain his communication style and his appeal? Well, uh, if you observe Donald Trump uh, over any period of time, what you realize is he likes to boast that he knows more than other people. He knows more about war than his generals. He knows more about the economy uh, than he, the economists that are advising him. He knows more about X than the X people who uh, uh, have got degrees in whatever X is. And I don't think such a person really exists. Uh, hmm. The person who's more expert than everybody else in everything just can't possibly be. Um, that suggests that maybe there are some shortcomings he's not aware of. Uh, I think that is probably the case. Uh, a little, it, it, I think it's somewhat complicated with him because I think that there's also a healthy dose of brand building. That whether hmm. whether he actually believes that he's an expert on nuclear weapons technology, he definitely wants you to think that he's an expert on that. Um, but, but zooming out from Donald Trump, why is it that we as people have so much trouble acknowledging and understanding our limitations in particular areas? Uh, uh, the reason we have trouble is because of a paradox, uh, which is that to spot expertise in other people, obviously, you need expertise in yourself. But that's also true for spotting lack of expertise. That is, to be able to tell when a person has a shortcoming or to tell when a person might be getting something wrong, well, you need the expertise to be able to judge that, the true expertise to judge that. Now, if you lack that expertise, it means that you lack the very knowledge you need in order to identify shortcomings. And that's true not only in judgments of other people, but it's also true of the self. Uh, so ultimately what that means is people who lack knowledge lack the knowledge to realize they lack the knowledge. If people don't understand that this is even necessarily a thing that exists, how do we try to get people to understand and recognize? Like, how do you get past this problem if people don't even know that it is a problem to, be, to get past? Well, what you need to do is you need to do something perhaps that is done in medicine, uh, which is called a competency challenge. That is, you uh, give people a test or you give people a task to do, uh, see, uh, ask them how well they think they're doing on it, and then you show them how well they're actually doing on it. Mm -hmm. And often what you find is people can very easily recognize uh, all of a sudden at that moment what they don't know. So, for example... Um, one common exercise uh, that can be done in the laboratory is if you ask people how a, how a helicopter works or how a ballpoint pen works, they'll go, yeah, sure, I absolutely know how that works. And then you say, okay, show me. Mm -hmm. And in detail, 
uh, how a helicopter works. Uh, and also, in, uh, by the way, um, like include the detail about how a helicopter moves forward and backward. <laughs> and uh, people uh, suddenly realize there are holes in their knowledge that they weren't aware of before. So there, there are things that you, can, uh, that you can do, but one of the things that you can do for yourself is often, if, um, if a question is important enough, do spend some time thinking about how you might be wrong. Uh, often uh, you begin to realize uh, cautions or questions that you wouldn't have been uh, otherwise aware of. Okay, interesting. Okay, so it's a complex process, but but I think that that uh, people can can take from that at least the beginning steps steps of dealing with this. It, it seems like one of the things that you gain through experience in a topic is factual knowledge about it. Um, particularly in politics, people seem to have a difficulty in differentiating between opinions that they hold strongly and things that are objectively true, um, mm-hmm. which might be another uh, psychological problem with humanity that's sort of inherent to it. Uh, is that a part of this problem, that people have a difficulty in understanding what is and is not actually a fact? I think that is part of it, because you can't know that you're factually wrong if you have a hard time identifying what a fact is. And in fact, what we find in our own work is that if you ask uh, Democrats or Republicans factual questions, not only opinion questions, but factual questions, they'll differ quite wide, wide, wildly in terms of uh, what they construe as facts in the ground when it comes to economics, uh, politics, or the social scene in America. So, mm-hmm. for example, uh, during the Obama administration, a majority of Republicans will say the stock market went down, a majority of uh, Democrats will say it went up. Um, what happened to the poverty rate the first two years of the Obama administration? Uh, Republicans will say it went up. Democrats will say it went down. Now, uh, the truth for one of those questions favors the Democrats. The truth for what the other question favors Republicans. But Republicans and Democrats tend to come to factual beliefs that only favor themselves. Yeah, yeah, and I've uh, I've actually taken a couple of those sorts of online tests about basic historical knowledge, and when you get the results and realize how you've been wrong, that's a humbling experience. Mm. Uh, it makes you realize what a what a you know a walking primate you are, <laughs> I guess, uh, that we still have these issues. So um, I want to ask you another question. I assume a little bit of this is going to be probably not as grounded in your research, but but I am curious about some of the implications. I, I wonder, politicians and members of the media. Um, Consciously or unconsciously, I wonder if people people in positions of authority and influence are becoming a little bit more savvy about exploiting some of these psychological issues and gaps um, to advance their agenda, whether political or a narrative that they're pushing. Uh, do you feel that 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 might be accurate? Well, I, I think uh, experts uh, uh, in dealing with people have always been somewhat aware of this. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, remember, P.T. Barnum said there's a sucker born every minute. Mm-hmm. So uh, this is, the fact that there is ignorance that can be exploited uh, is something that uh, has been known since time immemorial. I think with the Internet and with the high speed and the high availability of news, we it's just much more visible. Uh, mm-hmm. That is, we see a lot of other people falling prey to it. The only question is, is we don't see ourselves falling prey to it, and that's the next step that we have to achieve somehow. Okay, I'm going to work on that in advance of our eventual second conversation. Uh, Dr. Dunning, thank you so much for joining us. I've been wanting to talk to you about your research for quite some time, so thank you for joining us on The Damage Report. Thank you, my pleasure. Uh, also, as a quick aside, I just want to say, um, people love to like talk about like a hypothetical. Like, If I was able to go back in time, like 500 years, oh my God, with my modern knowledge, I could be king. I could rule all. I'd be able to invent all these technologies and everything. I don't think so. I, don't, I, couldn't, I couldn't make anything. A microwave is effectively magic to me. He brought up uh, helicopters and ballpoint pens. I could, if you gave me 10 years, I could not make a ballpoint pen for myself. So um, I think we should have a little bit of humility, even in fictional time travel scenarios. With that, we are going to take uh, one last break. When we come back, let's end the week on a little bit of a good note, a little bit of a rational and happy note after this. We come back with breaking news. According to the AP on Twitter, media reports Chicago prosecutors have charged R&B star R. Kelly with 10 counts of aggravated criminal sexual abuse. 
which is, a, that's a big development since the documentary came out just a couple of weeks ago. He will actually face a legal challenge. And Fox News had also reported that two more women have come forward with accusations of rape against him. I can't be any more specific about the actual charges. I'm sure that we'll have that soon. And you can expect that this is a topic that we will be discussing on the main show, The Young Turks, a little bit later on today. Uh, with that, let's turn to happier news. It is incredibly likely that the Democratic primary this time around is going to be as dirty as the last one, as aggravating, as charged with emotion. And so I want to at least start off with something a little bit happier, a little bit lighter, an attempt to keep people grounded with their eyes on the prize of where this thing is actually going to go. And so I started the say something nice challenge in terms of politics by uh, tweeting challenge. Say something nice in the comments below about a candidate you have no intention of supporting. With the goal being that you can acknowledge good things about people you won't vote for. You can acknowledge bad things about people that you will vote for. Simply because you support someone and want them to be president does not mean that they are an angelic being free from sin. And just because that person is the best one doesn't mean that they are gonna be surrounded on the debate stage by literally the spawn of Satan. So let's acknowledge some good things. Now, um, some people questioned whether this would work. Uh, Dork Sports Guy tweeted, isn't this level of positivity and maturity breaking all Twitter protocol? But it turns out it wasn't because thousands of you did in the end respond. Um, some people had to be dragged into it. Uh, ben Mankiewicz originally was very sarcastic, but I pressured him. And so he did engage in the challenge by saying, fine, Tulsi Gabbard is perhaps the lone candidate who will drive a critically important conversation about reducing our military spending and curbing our use of force around the world. Happy John? Yes, Ben, for once you've made me happy. And uh, other people jumped right into it. So Emma Vigland, a big friend of the show, said, Cory Booker really cares about animals and it's not for show. He has a long history of pushing for animals' rights. Tulsi Gabbard's support of an anti-interventionist foreign policy is rare and much needed. Amy Klobuchar can handle the cold really well. I like this game. And you know what, Emma? I like this game too, so let's play it some more. Uh, Sarah Smith, a candidate in the last cycle, tweeted, uh, this thread makes me kind of happy. I respect the tenacity of Senator Gillibrand and Kamala Harris. It's hard to be an outspoken woman in politics. Cory Booker is a great public speaker and really seems like he wants to do good, even if he's a little lost getting there. So there, she at the end started to stray a little bit, acknowledging some of the, the, the complications and problems, but still very much in the spirit of the Say Something Nice Challenge. Uh, Josh Belsman said, Bernie Sanders has a moral conscience worth admiring and economic policies worth pursuing. Now, I tweet things like that, but understand, Josh isn't gonna support Bernie Sanders. He doesn't wanna vote for Bernie Sanders, but he can look at Bernie Sanders and say, I get why some people like this person. In the same way that Emma, who is not gonna vote for Cory Booker or Amy Klobuchar, can acknowledge here is why people like who these people are, their history, what they stand for, what they do if they were elected. Um, so in that spirit, let's move on. Sarah responded, Kristen Gillibrand has an admirable record of opposing Trump and in fact has the lowest Trump score on 538.com. One more, Cory Booker is vegan, which shows he's capable of personal sacrifice in the service of principle. It speaks very well of his character. Consul Shades responded, Elizabeth Warren has taken some good stands against Wall Street in the past. And I think with strong progressive leadership, she would be a strong ally for many progressive ideas. Uh, Elisa tweeted, uh, Bernie Sanders' career-long commitment to the underserved is admirable. And uh, Matt Miner tweeted, Kamala Harris is smart as hell and her mind moves at lightning speed. And there were so many of these, literally thousands. Now, it's not all roses. Some people were completely disingenuous. Yes, there were some funny ones complimenting Donald Trump that were not compliments of Donald Trump. Uh, ben Mankiewicz had said that he buys only the best self-tanner. And there were some people who just wouldn't do it. They were just responding to these positive things by saying, yeah, but what about? And like the thing is, every other second of this primary is that sort of reply. For once, just briefly, for a couple of minutes, let's acknowledge that all of us are humans worthy of respect and dignity who aren't necessarily in politics only for the bad reasons. There's plenty of it. I mean, there are, like, I even feel the knee jerk response to be like, yeah, but they're funded by, but we're, we're gonna do that. We're gonna do that, okay? But I don't want us to end this process assuming that if we don't get our perfect candidate, it is because some like cosmic plot has been uh, uh, undertaken against us. Or that if I disagree with people, by the way, up to and including Bernie Sanders, that doesn't mean that they're awful. 
I can agree with people that I don't want to vote for. And so let's just keep that in mind. I'm going to occasionally unearth the Say Something Nice Challenge throughout this primary. Please engage if you see it. With that, thank you for joining us throughout this week. We'll see you next one. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.